Welcome to the Chomp Man tutorial series. Based on the beloved classic arcade game Pac-Man, this project was created to be an easy to follow step-by-step -step guide that would give you the tools, techniques, and experience of creating a full game from start to finish. We've made all the original assets that we created for the game completely free. Links in the description below. For this project, if you wish to follow along step by step, you will need to first download the Chompman project files, both of which can be downloaded in the downloads area of the tutorial site or from links in the description. In this Games Without Code video, we'll begin creating our gameplay by creating the movement controls for our Chomp character, as well as the dot pellets he'll consume throughout the level. Let's first start by opening our level 01 scene. And let's drag our Chomp Man character prefab into our scene. And we're just going to place him near the starting position of our level. Now with the character selected, we want to create a new flow machine. So we're going to go to add component and we're going to add a flow machine. And once we have our flow machine up, we want to create a new macro and we're going to call this macro player movement controls macro. And we're going to save that into our macro folder. So with the graph editor open, we can start developing our movement controls for our character. So the logic for our base move controls are fairly simple. We want whenever the controller presses up, down, left or right on a keyboard or joystick or the WASD key that the character will move in the appropriate direction. Now let's begin by first naming our flow machine and we're going to name that player movement flow. Let's begin creating our flow chart. Now to get our basic movement, we can use a get input axis and we're going to get both our horizontal and our vertical axis. So we're going to use a get input axis by name. And for our input axis name, we're going to use a horizontal. And now let's duplicate this. And for our second, we're going to have a vertical axis. Both the horizontal and vertical input axis are defined by unity. And if we go into edit project settings and we look at our input, we can see that unity has given us a default of a horizontal and a vertical input axis. And it has already defined our inputs for that axis. Now we can always go and we can add more to that, but at the moment we're just going to simply use the default. So we're going to close our project settings and back in Bolt, we're gonna grab a character control move node. And for our character control move node, what we need to do is we need to use the input from our accesses and use that to input into our character control move node. So to do that, we're gonna use a, we're gonna use a create a vector three with X, Y, and Z node. And for our X, we're gonna use a horizontal axis input and for our Z, we're gonna use our vertical input. So next we're gonna connect our update event into our character control, and then we're gonna use our output from our create vector three, and we're gonna add that into our character control as well. So now we have the basics for our control, let's test that out. So in Bolt, we can see that whenever we press our WASD, our arrow keys, or if we're using a joystick as well, or using a, a control pad as well, we now have our vertical and horizontal movement and it will our character will move accordingly. However, we can see we have a few issues with the speed of the movement as well as the fact that despite the fact we're moving the character isn't rotating or isn't turning the direction we're moving, it's simply looking forward. And something else you may have noticed, if we go into our scene view while we're in play mode, and let's go to our shaded wireframe or either our shaded and we can see despite the fact we set our blink state up in our one of our former exercises our character isn't blinking so let's go to that graph and we can see that we have these variables that aren't set so before we continue setting up our movement let's first fix our blink state so one of the problems that we're having with our blink state is it's not able to find our variables because our variables will seen variables. 
while we will be using scene variables for specific variables that will need to be set by other elements within our scene, for most of the variables in our Blink, we could just essentially set them as object elements. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna grab our variables and within Bolt, within our object variable window, we're gonna add these elements back into as far as object elements as well as change them within our nodes. So for our character mesh render, we're gonna keep that as a scene variable since we'll also need that variable to control when the character opens and closes his mouth when he's eating the pellets. So we're gonna set that as a scene variable. So aside from our character mesh render, we can set all of our other variables to object variables. So let's do that now. All right, now without all of our object variables now set, let's test that out and make sure that our blink is still working. So now with our blink working correctly again, let's select a chomp character we're gonna go back into our player movement flow. So the first thing that we wanna do is we wanna slow our player movement down. So to do that, similar to our blink speed, what we're gonna do is we're gonna divide that by a value. So let's use a scene value for this, and we're gonna call this player movement speed. And the reason that we're gonna, that we're using a scene value is because this value is also gonna be affected by other factors in the game. So once we have that created, let's create a divide node and let's divide both our input axis by the player movement speed. So let's set our player movement speed value. And before we test it out, let's go and let's make sure that this is set to a scene variable, not an object variable. And now let's test that out. We can now see that our character is moving much slower, much more manageable. So we can see here that our player is a little bit too big for the actual elements in the environment. So if we go and open our prefab, let's adjust the height down just a bit to about 0.85. So we can now see that our character is the right size and is able to fit in any of the areas in the map that he needs to go. So let's go back to our player movement flow. And let's add the ability so that the character looks a direction when we move that direction. So before we do this, first, let's first walk through the logic that we'll need to put in place to make this happen. So if we notice during play mode, once we press left and right up and down our input axis, we can see in bold that our input value is changing from a positive to a negative for both our horizontal and our vertical input. So we want to say whenever the input axis is set to a positive, turn this way. And whenever the input axis is set to a negative, turn this way. And we want to do that for both our horizontal and our vertical axis. So to do this, we need to compare the values that it's receiving from the axis. And if it's receiving the correct value, we need the character to turn that direction. So one of the ways that we can achieve this is using a comparison node, as well as a look at node to get the character to rotate that direction. And in our comparison node, we can see that we have the greater than, equal to, less than, not equal to, and so forth but we need a value for it to compare to be able to use our comparison node. So let's create two object float variables 
and we're going to call these move x value and move z value one to represent our horizontal input values and one to represent our vertical input values and we want to use the values that we're setting to create our vector 3 as well So before we move to adding in our look control, let's first make sure that everything is still working correctly. So we can see we still have our input and our character control and we can also see our X value as well as our Z value is being stored and set whenever we're moving the character. So let's organize these in a group real quick before we move on. And we're going to name one get vertical access and the other get horizontal access. And then the third, we're going to name that set player movement. So to group, if we hold control and we left click and we drag over all the nodes that we want to select, we can have a group for our nodes. And once a group is selected, we could then move all those nodes at once, as well as to help our graph to be a bit better organized. So at the beginning, we want to get our X value and we want to say if our character is either positive or negative, we want it to rotate that direction. And we're going to use a branch node similar to how we use within our blink as well as several of our other charts that we created. So we also want to make sure that updates and checks every frame. And from there, if it's true, we're going to use a transform look at world position node. And we're going to set that to a negative 90 in the X and we're going to duplicate this and we're going to say if that is negative, we also want that to be a positive 90 in the X. So let's grab all these nodes and we're going to control D to duplicate that. And then we're going to change this value to use the Z value. And then we're going to change these instead of a negative 90 on our X, we're going to do negative 90 on our Z and a positive 90 on our Z. Now let's group these. And we're going to call one rotate in the Z and we're going to call the other one rotate in the Y. Let's hit play and let's test our logic out. So we can now see that if we press left, our character is going to look left. If we press right, our character is going to look right. Press down, the character looks down. If we press up, the character is going to look up. And we can also see within Bolt that the moment we are pressing it is showing that that element is true. So the next thing that we want to do before we move on is we want to make sure that we update our prefab right now. It's just currently going to be on the object in our scene view. So to do that, what we can do is we can right click and we can go to copy component. We can open our prefab and we can go to paste as new component. And we can now see that we now have that player movement within our prefab. Back to our scene, we now have two. So let's delete our first one. So we just have the one that's in our prefab. And let's also copy our blink component. And let's go and op open our prefab. And let's paste these component values into our blink component. That way 
we still have all the changes that we made by adjusting these all to object variables. All right, and the next thing that we need to do is we need to make sure that we copy our object variables as well. So we're just gonna copy this, copy this component. We wanna go back into our prefab and we're gonna paste this into our object variables, gonna paste as value, save our prefab and go back into our scene, delete this, bring it, bring our character back into our scene just to make sure everything is working correctly. And we can now see our character blinks. We have our movement as well as the characters looking left and right. Now, one of the other things that we can do, since we added Doltween into our project, we can have that character smoothly transition to look that direction as well. So to do this, we could simply replace our look at transform nodes with a Doltween look at transform node. So if we hit play, we can now see our character has a much smoother transition into looking the direction opposed to just simply snapping in that direction. So we can adjust our speed that the character looks that direction if we feel it's too fast or too slow. And as a way to just simply adjust these uh, without having to go back in and type it in for each node what we can also do is we can we can create a float variable and use that to control all of our look at nodes so let's create a look at speed we're going to use that for our duration This way, if we want to change the value or uh, the speed that the character looks, so now we have our character look and our movement controls done. Let's move on to adding in the edible dots. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to create two game objects. We're going to call one scene manager and we're going to call the other one dots. We're going to place our scene variables inside of our scene manager just for the sake of organization. Next, we're going to find our dot mesh, which is in our Chompman mesh folder under props. And we're going to drag that to be a child of the dots game object. And let's place that behind our chomp man character. Next, we're going to create a material for our dots game object. And we're going to place that within our prop folder. And I'm just going to drag that material on our dots game object. And we're just going to add just a little bit of a mission. The next thing we want to do is we want to add a spherical collider and we're going to make that a trigger to our dots game object as well. I'm just going to make that just a little bit larger than our dots game object. Next, let's tag our dots game object and we're going to create a new tag. I'm just going to call that tag dots. So with our initial setup created, let's create a flow state for our game object. We're gonna save this into our macro folders and we're gonna call this the macro for our flow state dots macro. So before we begin creating a flow state, let's first walk through the logic that we're gonna to need to set in place. So when our character goes over our dots palette, the dot palette disappears and the character's mouth open and close blend shape is activated. So let's begin with a on trigger enter node. 
So for on trigger enter node, we want to make sure that it first checks to make sure that our character is actually the one interacting with it. We don't want our ghost to be able to consume the dot pellets as well. So we're going to begin by using a component compare tag and the tag that we wanted to compare is the tag of the player. So, so let's create a string scene object. Let's call that value player since that's the tag of the player that we set in our previous lesson. I'm just going to drag that into our scene and we want to say if that is true. So we want to use a branch node. So we're going to say if this result is true, we want it to destroy this game object as well as activate the mouth open and closing blend shape. So to do that, let's create a Boolean scene variable and let's call this variable can eat. So we want to say if that's true, we want to set that can eat to true. Then we want to destroy this game object. And we're going to say self. So before we add the chomp blend shape functionality, let's go and make sure that this is working correctly. So we can see that we have our can eat is true. Our dot is destroyed. So for now we can remove our start and our update and let's go back to our chomp character and let's go to our blink state machine and we want to right click and create a new super state and we're going to call this super state eating SS. So let's go into our super state for our start state. I'm just going to call that idle and we're going to right click and we're going to create another flow state. We're going to make a transition and in that transition, we want that to check if the eating bull is true. So we're going to grab our, our eating Boolean and we're going to get a branch node and we're going to say if true, we want it to transition and we're going to have an update because we want to make sure that's checking every frame. And let's call this eating. And let's go back in our transition. And let's copy this right here and go back out and create another transition going from eating back to idle. And let's paste that into our new transition. And we're going to say on false, we want that to transition back. So for now, we're going to delete everything that's inside of that state. And since we already have our blend shape action set up within our state machine, let's go into our blinking state. So let's grab all our nodes. We're going to copy these and we're going to paste these into our eating. And we're going to replace our blinking weight in our blinking speed variable with a similar flow variable, but we're going to name that mouth weight and mouth speed. And we're going to make these object variables. And let's go 600 for our mouth speed. And we also want to make sure that we change our index of our set blend shape weight to one. Because if we go back into our character, into our skin mesh, we can see the blend shape for our mouth is actually the second blend shape. And since our index starts in a similar way as an array, our first number starts at zero and our second one starts at one. Next, we want to put the logic in place that once the mouth weight equals 100, that the can eat then equals false. So it transitions back to the idle state. So before we continue, let's test our logic, but we first need to go back into our main state and we need to make sure that this is toggle start as well. 
So we should now have our, both our blink and our eat state green. So we can see that we're in our idle state. And we can see that once we ate the pellet that our character closed his mouth. So now let's put the logic in place that the character opens his mouth once it transitions back to idle. So what we're going to do is we're just going to grab all these nodes that we had for the closing. And I'm just going to copy those and we're going to go to our idle. I'm just going to paste those in our idle. So we need to change this add to a subtract. And the next thing we need to do is we need to add a logic node to say that we only want this to happen once the value is greater than zero. So while the character is in idle and at zero, we don't want to continue to subtract from our blend shape. So we're going to say once if the mouth value is greater than zero, we want it to begin subtracting from that mouth value until it equals zero. So let's duplicate a couple of these. We're going to go into our idle and let's go a little bit closer so we can make sure we can see everything happening. Let's hit play. So we can see that the character now opens and closes his mouth whenever he eats one of the dots. So now that we have that complete, let's add the sound effect to once our character eats the dots. So we're going to go to our dots flow graph and we want to add a play audio source one shot. And we also want to create a scene variable for our audio source as well. So we're going to go into our scene variables and we're going to say audio FX source. And before we place our value in there, let's go to our camera, our main camera. Let's create a new game object and we're going to call this game object sound FX audio source OBJ. And let's create one for our game music as well. So we're going to duplicate this game object and we're going to just create one for our game music and just going to call this one game music audio source. And I'm just going to place an audio source component on both of these. Now let's go back to our scene variables and let's set this as an audio source variable type and let's drag our sound effects audio source to this value. We want to move that out and we want to make sure that it's getting our audio source value. So we also want to set this to before it destroys the game object because once it's destroyed, it won't be able to play our audio source. So we want to set that right in front of the source game object. So the next thing we want to do is we want to add our eating sound effect. So if we go under our audio folders, under effects, we can find our munch one and munch two. So we're just going to grab our munch one. I'm just going to drag that into our audio one shot. So if we hit play now, we not only have our our blend shape animation of our character eating them pellets, but we also have our sound reinforcement as well. So let's grab our pellets and what we're going to do is we want to drag these into our prefab folder and we want to make a prefab uh, of our pellet. So we're going to go to our prefab folder. We're going to go under props. I'm just going to drag that into our prefab to make a prefab variant of this object. Let's go and we're also going to make sure our transform and our positions are zero and we're going to remove these and we can now set up our dots prefab into our scene. 
But before we do that, we also want to make sure that we update our chomp prefab as well. Since we added those extra elements into our blink state machine, as well as the extra object variables. So we're going to again, copy the component from both our state machine and our object variables and go into our open prefab and make sure that's updated as well. So we're going to save our scene and now we're going to just lay out our dots across our scene. So in the next lesson, we'll continue adding on to our gameplay, adding our point system and point display, as well as our power up and power pellets as well. So be sure to save your scene and join us in the next lesson. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell to be the first to see this and many other tutorials, game development tips, interviews, and free game asset giveaways.